that's been uh, coming together. And I just want a, a little bit of review of some of our past messages that uh, we, we saw uh, in the Old Testament that the sons of Issachar had understanding or discernment of the seasons, the times that they were living. And we've, we have watched a contrast between passivity and passion. See, people, of many people, Satan has made many people who come to church very passive, worn out, go through the motions, walking in the energy of their own flesh, and their energy of the but making their own decision, come to church every now and then, put some money in the offering. But, but what's happened, we think that we've matured. But the truth is we've become passive. Okay, so there's a passion spirit, but there's a very passion. Can I be very honest? See, w- w- watch, a, watch a big boy ball game. Watch it. There, there'd be people that would be staying, standing during the whole ball game. And they don't wear a shirt. They paint themselves up and they stand and they're shouting. And they wait, out, they wait in line for a long time to get in. And so I say that we got more than what they have. Yeah. See, but we, we really need to come in contact with God. We're not just coming here. A lot of legalism. There's a, the enemy wants to make you passive. And God wants to make his passion towards God. Yeah. So we've looked at a lot about the office of a prophet. We've seen uh, apostolic ministry. And remember, the kingdom of heaven suffers. Violent and the violent, the energetic, will take it. Okay, so we're gonna get, we're gonna fight. We're gonna take back any ground we gave to the devil. Satan disguises himself as an angel light. Compromise and complacency will lead someone to uh, uh, apostasy, which is, which means the full falling away from God. What God is doing, and we're gonna see this in our message tonight, that God is is raising up a church. He's building a church. The gates of hell will not prevail again. He wants to bring you and I to a place, full engagement towards God. Our inner man is fully engaged seeking God and fully engaged against the powers of darkness that will come against us. Okay, so, well, again, if we become passive, go through the motion. See, if I have been seduced by religion, then I'm not really passionate. I'm not, I'm not real energetic. Okay, so God, that's what God's doing. He's He's building a church that gets to hell with that provision. So he's allowing some storms and some wind to blow, some winds of adversity coming against us. Okay, so uh, we have a goal, and one of the goals is uh, that we would have unbroken fellowship with God, unbroken fellowship and communion with God. We're, we're coming to a place that we're working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It's time to talk back to the devil. In Acts 5.41, they rejoice that they were, we saw this Wednesday night, they rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer for his holy name. Worthy to suffer for his holy name. Okay, so if, uh, if one little thing goes wrong in our life, one little thing goes wrong, will we throw in the towel? Will we become angry? Will we become upset? So we've got to get our, our inner man fully engaged with God and against the powers of darkness. Okay, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 3 through 5 talks about the weapons of our warfare. Tonight we're going to see some weapons of our warfare. In Job 23.10, when he tries me, when God, when, I, when he tries me, I shall come forth, pure as gold. And see, God, are gonna, God will put you and I into something, and his goal is that we come out with more than what we had when we went into it. Yes, you. You, you would be put in circumstances and situation that you don't have the faith to handle. That's right. But you could get the faith, because you know the faith cometh. If you don't have it, you can get faith coming as I come by the Word of God. You exercise, you will grow in faith by exercising your faith. You, you'll, uh, you'll become muscle-bound by exercising your body. And we become spiritual and uh, more powerful by exercising our faith. In uh, Isaiah 48, 10, that I've chosen you. I've chosen you in the furnace, in the furnace of affliction. Don't run from your own personal furnace. Don't run from your own personal Gethsemane. Come on, Saints of God. God is bringing God people to a place that we got to learn either we're going to sink or we're going to learn how to swim. Amen. God will put us in a place the natural man yeah. disdains being in, but the spiritual man yes. loves it. See, that, that's how the inward man. You'll be put in the circumstance or situation that, spiritually speaking, is either sink or swim. And, uh, and uh, God will allow us to be put in the circumstance you don't know what to do. But you go to God, you find out what to do. And when God comes through, then your faith increases because you were put against something that you couldn't handle in your own energy and your own strength. That's how God will break that independent spirit to bring us to a place of becoming 
dependent upon, upon God, that will no longer every day live in the energy of our flesh, make our own decision, and then get mad when God doesn't bless our decision, that we will get to a place that we will seek ahead of time and we'll pray God what God has directed that we admit that, that we need God. Then lastly, in my introduction, uh, Hebrews thirteen fifteen said, let us offer the sacrifice to praise to God Continually, continually, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, the fruit of our lips giving praise unto his holy name. All right, in Acts chapter 16, Paul here, uh, Saul who's been made by God into Paul, then came, it came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, I love that, I love the way it says that, a son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, which means he was a Gentile, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him and what Paul had to go forth with him. So Paul is asking Timothy to come with him. Paul is going to mentor a discipleship of Timothy. Timothy will become like a spiritual son to him. So Paul would have him to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in his court, for they all knew that his father was a Greek or a Gentile. Verse 4, and as they went through the cities, this is Paul and Timothy, that's who they is. As Paul and Timothy went through the city, they delivered them the decrees for help that were ordained to the apostles and the elders that were in Jerusalem. So were the churches established in the faith and increased in the number daily. Increased daily. What the will of God? That we would increase daily. Okay, now verse 6. Now when they uh, just lay a little foundation, if I lay this little foundation, you understand where we're going better. Verse 6. And when they'd gone through Pergia, uh, the region of Galatia, they were forbidden, very important you understand that, they were forbidden or prevented by the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. And theologians go all over why, why that happened. Let's just say that they, I'll just put the way that they were forbidden by the Holy Ghost, don't go there. See, sometimes God, it's not God's timing. Sometimes God didn't want them to go there, sometimes it's not God's timing. So anything I would say that really is conjecture because, uh, theologians are all over why they were forbidden. And they come to My- Mysia, and they uh, said to go to wherever, and the, and the Spirit of God didn't allow them. So there's two verses in a row. They were forbidden by the Holy Ghost to go to Asia, and by the Spirit of God didn't allow them to go to the other place. But they passed through Mysia, came to Troas. And a vision. So God speaks to, to Paul by a vision. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man called a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, come over to us, come over to Macedonia. This is what we call in in ministry a Macedonian call. So basically, the call is going to be called to this area, and how God's going to call him to this area, that in the vision, he sees this man, and this man is pleading with him to come to Macedonia. Come over to Macedonia and help us. Come over to help Macedonia and help us. What a call, What what a mighty call of God. When, when you receive that kind of guidance and that kind of direction and instruction, that kind of knowledge from God, God speaks to him a vision. And so there's this heart cry in Macedonia, come and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, or, or Europe, uh, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called, that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came to a straight course to wherever, so the, the next day, so they, God said, there's a mission the only call, and immediately they go. They, they, they hear the, they, God gives them a call, and immediately they obey. And you hear me say this all the time, but I can't say that too often, because we have got, every one of us got to get this in our life. God will give you a word, and in that word there'll be an assignment. Then God will just stand back and watch who comes to alignment with the assignment, and he knows God knows who he can build with and who he cannot build with. Okay, so every one of it tonight, tonight in this service, everybody will receive a word. And the whole the answer would be, it's not enough to hear what God's saying. We must come into alignment with the assignment that he gives it. When, when, uh, when, we, when we backslide into religion, we'll come and we hear, but we don't do. And then we go out with it, and then we live in our own energy, and then we come back to a church service again, and we hear what the Spirit's saying, but if we don't do it, then we're, we're going out again, and we're, so we're hearing, and we're hardening our heart, and we, we end up getting worse than, than actually better. So God is looking for people that he can speak to, 
that will obey him. It's not the hearers that are justified. It's the doers of the word that, that are justified. So we really need to understand because we, because we know something in the Bible doesn't mean that we have it. So we never get to the place where we, I don't need to hear about love anymore. I don't need to hear. See, we can, we can, uh, someone could come up and say, well, I'm going to preach on 1 Corinthians chapter 12 or 1 Corinthians 14 on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, I've heard that before. But the problem would be we don't, we're not operating in the gifts. But we shut down because we know it. But what God said to it, you don't have it. So I, I love you and I want you to get this. But we don't have it. So that's, that's why God will preach thing, have us preach thing that we, uh, we've already heard. But we, he's trying to say, I want you to get this. Okay, so God's, God gives him this vision, and the, what we call the Macedonian call. And he responds. And immediately they begin the set course to go there. Verse 12, and from there to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. And a colony, and they were in that city abiding certain days. So they're, they're at one place, and they get this basic day on the call, and they leave where they're at, they go on a ship to another place, and they, and they ride there, and they're in the cheap city, and then they're in Philippi. Okay, now the, verse 13, now the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where a prayer was wont to be made. Okay, so they go by the river, they go by the riverside where a prayer was about to be made. And we sat down and spoke to the women that were there. Okay, so here they're having this little Bible study. They're having this little gospel meeting by by this river. A scenic little place, a peaceful place, very scenic. You see the water flowing? And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, purple which means basically probably she was, you know, a, a seamstress, a seller of purple in the city of uh, Thyatira, which worshiped God. How does it describe her? A woman, a seller of pur- a purple that worshiped God, heard us, and her heart, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended to the things that were spoken of by Paul. So Paul is preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, Now, so basically, then this woman, this woman loves God, and then Paul preaches, they have this Bible study, and she realized, okay, Jesus is the Messiah. So when she received Jesus to be the Messiah, she accepts Christ, and now she's being water baptized. Now she says to them, now remember, Paul and Silas, they come, they come from one area to another area uh, where, where no one really knows them. Okay, so she was baptized in her household. She besought us, besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to God, come to my house and abide there. And she constrained them. Okay, so this woman has, number one, an open heart. And she opens her home. And she's opening her purse. Okay, so the, she, the, you see a response to the gospel. And when, when uh, what is happening is that the word of God being preached and her life is being changed, and you see her life coming to alignment right before your eyes. Okay, so she opens up her heart, she opens up her home to to people to come in, and then she opens up her finances to to meet their financial need. Okay, now verse sixteen, and it came to pass as we went to prayer, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination uh, met us. Okay. A lot of us in the church were familiar with this with this text, but we're kind of going to a, a different direction. So I'm not going to really I'm not going to really belabor that. It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us. Okay, the word uh, divination means inspired by Satan. It means a python spirit. Okay, so demon powers have a hold of this woman. Okay, so as we went to prayer, okay, so they're they're getting ready to pray. And what happens, a, a demonized person met him. Okay, so the, here's an attack before their prayer meeting. They're getting ready to pray. As they went to prayer, then a demonized person that had a spirit of divination, a python spirit, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying, which, which means that foretelling, uh, utter, it means to utter spells, it means to rave by demonic inspiration. So it's one thing to be in, say something in the flesh, it's one thing to say something by the Spirit of God. It's another thing to say things being motivated and inspired by demonic powers. This woman has demons, and the demons are manifesting in her, and the demons are speaking to her, and the demons are speaking through her. Okay, so there they are. They've come from one area to a totally different area, and they have this prayer meeting, and, and uh, Lydia's saved, and different things are happening. There's a baptism. They're having a uh, uh, place to stay. They're having food to eat. And it came to pass that we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed by a spirit of divination, meant that brought her masters much money by soothsaying. And the same followed Paul and us, 
and cried, saying, These are the men, these are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. Now, the right thing's being said, but with the wrong spirit. You're going to be around people that will be saying the right thing, but something inside of your spirit, man, will, it will register something wrong somewhere. It just will set crooked in your spirit. So the, 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 they're following Paul, and they're crying, say, These men are the servants of the Most High God. They're showing us the way of salvation. And this they did. She did many things, but Paul being grieved in the spirit. Okay, so Paul was grieved. Okay, so look right here just a minute. So the, they explain that. There, there are going to be people that would be saying the right These These men are the Most High God. They're saying the right thing, but there's something wrong somewhere. And it doesn't register within your spirit man that there, there's something demonic here. There's a, there's a familiar spirit here. Something demonic here is operating. So they're following Paul for many days. And uh, see, there's going to be, uh, with, with deliberate, there, we're not always the real quick on the, the draws. That someone didn't walk by, you know, just try to cast the demon out of them. Paul is ministering for many days, and this woman comes around, and he's discerning for many days. And then with this one day, uh, when, it, when it's the right time, but Paul, being grieved in the spirit, turned and said to the spirit, then said to the woman, said to the demon, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. In the name of Jesus, come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of making money was gone, they called Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. Now, what offended them? What offended these people? A supernatural, the miracle of God. Okay, so over and over again, you're, you're seeing everything. Uh, recently, we talked, we talked about Acts chapter 3. And in Acts chapter 3, uh, they had the upper, upper room experience in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 3, then, they went, to, they, went to the, uh, they went to the temple to pray. And when they went to the temple to pray, there was a man with his little tin cup, and he's begging money. And case, so Paul, Paul says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I given to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And the lame man had been begging their money for years because his only perspective was, if I hang around church-going people, they're a little kinder than people out in the world. So they, every day they would bring the lame man. The man could not walk. The man was lame. Now, I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that come to church with their lame in the spirit. They can walk in the natural, but not walk in the spirit. This man came to the temple. He could not walk in the natural. He was lame from birth, and they brought him there because his whole goal was he had no expectation of being healed. He had no expectation of being delivered. He had no expectation of vision being restored. All he knew, if I go there, maybe somebody will drop some coins in my tin cup. We're in trouble when people out there that are sick and lame and all kinds of problems, when the only thing that they look at the church as is somebody might help me pay my bills. Yeah. It's, a, it's a sad day. Yeah. But see, somebody had an upper chamber experience. Somebody climbed up to the upper chamber, and somebody got a baptism of, of the Holy Spirit and a baptism of fire. And who got this baptism? But people that had forsook Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, so these people had forsook him. They had... They had met Jesus, they, they had gotten saved, they followed Jesus for three years, and then when it came to the Garden of Gethsemane, they fled, and they, the Bible said, they all forsook him. Anybody beside me kind of stayed back a little bit? The Bible said they all forsook him, and then the Bible said that Peter followed him from afar. But see, then Jesus said, tarry until you are due with power from on high. I'm saying you can make him a great big mistake, and God can still use your life. These people forsook Jesus Christ. They fled from their own personal Gethsemane. They denied him. Peter denied him three times. And then he began to, when he did follow Jesus, he began to follow from afar. Because if I follow too close, this is real risky. I'm getting some answer. I'm going to get a little bit of amen over here. Okay. If, you get, if I get too close, you're going to mess with my stuff. It's going to deal with my life. Come to see in religion, nobody ever gets confronted about everything. We come in and we leave the same condition. Day after day, we get to week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. But somebody see Jesus said, be like, what, what we have is not working. So you're going to, he said, tear and tell you are due with power. And the same people that had fallen short of the glory of God, who had forsook Jesus Christ, had the faith, they had to work through the condemnation. I forsook him. I made a mistake. I walked away from God. I followed from afar. They had to work through the condemnation and have faith to climb up to the upper chamber because Jesus had given a word. And in that word there was a sign. Terry, and tell you. Yeah. Terry, and tell you are. Yeah. See, are we, 
are we just coming in and going through, or, or are we tearing your tail? Are every day are we are we working towards a go a constant fellowship, unbroken fellowship and relationship, unbroken fellowship with the manifested presence of God? That's what God wants to bring you to. Not just come to church service, the church will look in, put some money in the offering, they go home and live like we've been living. There, no, we're going. You're going to you're going to be with God such a way that your life will change. And see, you're going to, we're going to get in that upper chamber. We're going to crawl up there ourselves. We're going to work through our condemnation. We're going to have the faith to get up there. Something's going to happen. God's going to do something in here. This is going to be an upper chamber for some people. Some people are going to be with God in such a way and that when you come down from that upper chamber, in Acts chapter 3, the man that was laid, he had been begging there for years, but they, somebody had to... The reason he was there for years was because the right person had walked by yet. <laughs> come on, saints of God. You're going to tarry until you are so endued by power, God, that people that you've been around a long time, they're going to see such a change in you that the people that have been lame, that have been lame from, from birth, that could never walk in the power of the demonstration of the, of the Spirit of God, you're going to have so much that you're going to have something to give to them. Because the Bible said this, that uh, Elijah had a tremendous anointing from God, but Elijah said, I want twice as much of what you have. And so it shows in the Scripture that... And, uh, uh, an anointing can be imparted to other people. So something, something happened in that upper chamber that when Peter and them came down and they went to the temple of God, the man that was laying got up from there. And the name of silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give. Come on, saints of God. We're not going to be able to give lame people something unless we've done it ourselves. Hell didn't want you to get it. That's why, see, we're, we're not here to... We're not, this is not some kind of Christian social club alone. This is not some kind of lonely hearts club. Come on, we come here to be with God. Our life is going to be changed. Yeah. Come on, saints of God. Yes. Something going to happen. Yeah. Now, I said that the same then. Oh, yes. In this miracle happened in chapter 3, chapter 4, 5, and I don't know, it goes on and on there for quite a while. And everything that happened, then persecution, warfare, they get, they get lied about, they get falsely accused. They get uh, locked up in jail. They get beaten. They get threatened. Don't don't speak anymore in this name. And everything that happened happened because the lame man began walking. Oh, yeah. See now in this in this case in this case is that uh, the demonized woman got set free. And they yeah. and when when the church is so alive and so anointed that it's affecting society. And you begin to touch the idols of society, the idols of culture, sex devils, money devils. When you begin to touch that, all oh, hell will rise up against you. So right here, okay, so they got this woman strung out, and they, they're making a lot of money off of this woman. When you begin, when the church is so on fire, it begins to affect the economy. When you get people that's losing a whole bunch of money to the gambling casino, you get them saved. The people in the gambling casino get mad. When you get when you get drug addicts saved, it makes the drug dealer mad. When you get alcoholics saved, it makes the bartender mad. We're not making we don't see you down here anymore. Well, we're drinking the new wine. We haven't stopped drinking. We just change what we drink. We're drinking the new wine because the new wine is better than the old. See what I'm telling you, this is not some kind of Christian lonely heart club. Stumble in here, slither in, lower in the stick in the wagon track, slither up on our pew, stay there, coil up for a while, and then slither back out and go back to our electronic devices. No, we're going to be with God such a way. Our life is going to be changed. I'm telling you, you God wants to give us something. See, we're no longer, we're not, we, I might be the lame man. I'm not leaving here lame. Come on, I'm going to rise up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. So it, it makes them, it makes them mad because what happens is, it's affecting these people's pocketbook. And when you begin to affect gods of society, hell will rise up against you. That's why I shared those so many things. Because the kingdom of heaven is suffering violent. And the violent... Now what I'm telling you, we're going to see some things. Some things happen back there in Acts chapter 3 when they came down from there. You're going to see some things happen here. And the reason I'm saying this, if you not don't understand the hour that we're living in, that's why I shared this. Sons of Issachar, they had an understanding of the time they were living in. If you don't understand the times that you're living in right now, God has you. This is one of the darkest hours in history of planet Earth. And God has you alive on Earth at this time. You have an assignment. 
And hell doesn't want you to hear that you've got the same. Hell doesn't want you to see. Hell doesn't want you to understand. Hell wants you to think Christianity is just coming, putting your body in church service for a while, and then going out and living like we be living. You're going to meet with God such a way. Lame people Amen. are going to rise up and walk. Because, because your, ankle, your ankles have been healed. Your lameness, your lameness is gone, and now you're walking. You're not walking in the end of the flesh. You are now walking in the power and in the demonstration of the Spirit of God. You once walked in the energy of the flesh, but now you're walking in the Spirit. And they, see, the antidote for walking, they, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's an answer. I don't care how fleshy someone been. They get walking in the Spirit. It's better than walking in the flesh. It is more fulfilling. I've walked in both realms. I've walked in both realms in my past. I'm telling you, uh, the walking in the Spirit is a better realm. Now see, uh, what I'm saying is, uh, the, God wants to give us something that will stick to, stick to our ribs tonight. That we need to understand that uh, this is a very sober, serious hour, and God is building a church. The gates of hell will not prevail again. So God is, has us here tonight, and God wants to give us something that if a uh, Demon spirit the size of a gnat comes and whispers in my ear, go be a mass murderer. I will not be a mass murderer. The gnat will not conquer me. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> if, I'm, if a demon spirit no bigger than, no more powerful than the gnat is still slapping me around and defeating me and beating me. If that demon the size of a gnat is overcoming me, if... Uh, what's the way out? Uh, that's, that's a bunch of nonsense. But see, if I'm coming in here and I have nothing to give, something is overcoming me, whether it be the size of a gnat, a fly, or a bumblebee. Something defeating me. And I'm telling you, God wants to set the captive free. He wants to do a tremendous work with it. God wants to give us something that will, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up in there. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And when the men got up and began walking and leaping and praising God, What I'm saying is God wants to really get something because the kingdom of heaven is separate violent and the violent is taking it by force. There's a great big contrast between passivity and passion. God wants to, God wants to just give you a baptism, not only of the Holy Spirit, but a baptism of fire, the fire of God. And remember, there was a, there was a word about the fire being here. So I need to clarify something. And I, I see four different fires. There's a fire of judgment where Elijah called down the fire. There's Acts chapter 2, the equipping fire. There's a cleansing fire that you see in Malachi chapter 3. And then there's a fiery trial. The title of my message tonight is, Can God Trust You With Trouble? My, t- my title tonight, Can God Trust You With Trouble? Or does he, have to, does he have to wear out his angels? Does he have to surround me with 50 angels to protect me if I, if I got my picnic out there, my picnic table, I've got my little sandwich out there, and if a fly lands upon my, my sandwich, am I going to become a mass murderer and blame God? You should have protected my food. Yeah. Am I that vulnerable? Am I that weak? Can God trust me with trouble? Will I be faithful? Or if a fly, if a mosquito lands on me, <laughs> am I going to rebel and go to hell and blame God for it? Am I going to blame the church? Am I going to blame my mate? Am I going to... Well, the... uh, we'll go there. <laughs> Sometimes I get too honest. Hang on, saints of God. Come on. Okay. So they, this woman is possessed by demon powers. And, they can, and uh, let, me, let me just put it this way. Uh, one of these days I'm going to preach a message. And the title of my message will be Two Words That Changed My Life. <laughs> All of y'all stole my thunder. How did I know that you would know where I was going? So what did, what did Paul say to her? Did, did Paul say, uh, do you have held the church? <laughs> did, he, <laughs> did he send it to a psych ward? What did Paul do to this woman? What did he say? And what happened? How will you and I deal with things that are provoking our spirit, man? Paul's spirit is grieved. You ever been around someone upsetting you? Something from somewhere. Something, you're getting on my nerves. <laughs> Paul knew something was wrong. 
and he, he and so a little bit of time go by. He's not real quick on the draw. But he go, uh, you see, he discerned something, and he said, "When the right time, at the right place." He said, "In the name of it, come out of there," and it came out the very same hour. And when the people had us saw that the hope of making money was gone, they caught. Now watch what happens, okay? Because I want you to understand, this is this is what Satan is trying to do to the church. Satan is trying to bombard the church to put us back in a little quarter, uh, storefront churches. Keep your keep your little church, keep your little message. Just be quiet. Sit in church. Go through some dead religious ritual. Don't come alive with God. Don't get baptized. Don't but don't start talking to tongues. Don't get don't get fired. Don't get anointed. Don't bring the gospel out of here. Just go through the motion. And see when you begin to affect society, when when you have so much of God that. God through you changes culture. Culture doesn't affect you. You affect culture. Instead of one old time. What are these old time myths? I can't remember which one. In the beginning, the world affected him. But in the end, he affected the world. Come on, saints of God. We're not going to be saved and be on fire for a while and then retreat to religion for the rest of our life. We're not going to shrink. We're going to grow spiritually. Amen? We're going to increase. Our faith will grow. Our love will grow. Our anointing will grow. Come on, reach out and touch him tonight, saints of God. You're not talking to me tonight. Come on, saints of God. Now, so uh, when when her, when her master saw that the hope of making money was gone off of this woman, they called Paul and Silas and drew them to the marketplace and to the rulers. And they brought them to the magistrate saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. What was the accusation? They have a, such an anointing, it's affecting culture. And culture becomes mad. You're affecting our bottom line. We were making a lot of money off of her, and now we're not making any money. You set her free. You kept the demons out of her. And I don't like it. And so they take him to the ruler, and the accusation, these men are troubling our. I hope, uh, I hope you hear bad things about me. Because the Bible said, what would you and all men speak well of you? See, what I'm telling you, if you're going to be a real Christian, you're going to be alive, hell going to come against you. If you state an opinion, people who have a different opinion are going to come against you. Oh, yeah. And if you and I don't deal with our rejection, yeah. see, the devil's just trying to get us shut up. And the goal, the goal of Christianity is not, not to get to the point we don't offend people. Jesus said, a man's enemy be of his own household. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring priests, but division. I came to bring a sword. A man's enemy shall be of his own household. We got to stop being afraid of willing uh, that we might we might offend someone. So we just call we just shut ourselves up. We we'll stick our head in sand, pretend there's no problem, and we'll call it. We're going to win them by love. But the truth is, we become passive, and the devil has shut up our mouth, and the devil has trained much of the church. If you become open and you begin to affect culture, culture will attack you and try to put you shut your mouth up. I'm preaching better some saying amen. You're not talking to me tonight. Come on, saints of God. Now, uh, I, I don't know how God deals with you, but let me just tell you how he deals with me. Have you ever just, and you were serious, you, you, you meant it. God, I want a new anointing. See, but I didn't know how it would come. So I'm thinking it's just oh, power just going to come <laughs> floating down. I didn't realize it would come like fiery furnaces. Fight your way through this. I didn't realize lions then, wilderness wanderings. I'm telling you, you, God, you pray a prayer like that. God said, I hear that. I'm going to put you in something you don't have the faith, you don't have the power, you don't have the love to get through this thing. But, and so I've got to grow. So that before I wasn't praying them, I, I prayed enough to impress myself. <laughs> well, one honest person, all right. <laughs> all right. Come on. Come on, there are times, there are just times where we just, we just pray because we're supposed to pray. We're not, we, we're not really that hungry. Come on, say, you see what I'm saying? And what I'm telling you, that you, you'll come in some... You know, the Holy Ghost, God may use someone to inspire you, to motivate you. And you pray some prayer. I want a new anointing. Okay. <laughs> what I'm telling you, a great fighter by the name of Muhammad Ali, he needed a smoking Joe Frazier 
to motivate him to a whole new level. That when the, when these two gladiators got in the ring and they're fighting, and it was a 15-round a, a fight, and it came to the end of the 14th round, and smoking Joe Frazier's eye, one eye, was, he's bleeding so bad, he can't see out of one eye, and, and Cassius Clay uh, is sitting in the other corner, and, he's, and he, what's going on inside of him, if I go out one more round, I'm going to die. This guy will kill me. So both of them are sitting in the two corners getting ready to come out for the last round. And I'm telling you that, that uh, Smoker Joe Fraser's uh, corner had to throw in the towel. But see, there's gladiators. I'm telling you that what I'm telling you that God will put someone in your life, circumstances within your life, that either we're going to sink or we're going to swim. Yeah. That you won't know what to do. That's and right. so you get to seek God. Right. See, you say, like, oh, God, I want to know your voice. Okay, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to create circumstances for you. You don't know what to do. Amen. <laughs> Jonah, Jonah wasn't real willing to pray until he got swallowed up by a great big fish and he found himself in the belly of a whale at the bottom of the ocean. And all of a sudden he figured out, you know I think it's time to pray. He figured out how to pray. Come on, say something, God. I'm telling you that God is so wise. He's such a wise master builder that he'll put you in circumstance and situation you don't even realize. It's an answer to your prayer. Amen. One time, yes. Good. one time all hell broke loose against me. And I went, and I got low with God. I, God, what are you doing? God said, I'm answering your prayer. I said, I bind you, Satan. <laughs> I said, God, what are you doing? He said, I'm answering your prayer. What do you mean? Didn't you pray for more love? I put someone in your life that's real difficult. To... It doesn't take a lot of, come on, to, to love a Pastor Jan. God will put someone that's just made out of bump wire. What is really happening, I'm telling you, saints of God, that God was attempting to give us something, that culture that will inoculate us from culture, yes. and that we will begin to affect culture, and culture will no longer affect us. We will change culture. Yes. Now, uh, no. what are they, uh, inoculation, but, uh, boy, they, they, uh, immunization. immunization. Oh. And, and to immunize, you know, they say, uh, well, uh, go go get go get your flu shot. They say, well, go get your flu shot. And uh, what it what it does, it gives you enough of the flu that your body your body fights off. And so they they call it immunization. They're going to immunize yourself again so that that you won't get the flu. Many people they come to church enough to get immunized from the real Jesus. They never really catch. Not enough to to know, but not have wow. know about love, but not know about the gifts, but not have been immunized because got enough to think we're waiting for the reality. Yes, my God. Still being affected by culture, culture not affecting us. Come on, saints of God, I'm telling you that there's an open heaven, and I'm telling you there's a people that God that they that they will not settle for being pass, passive. They will become passionate, and then they're going to trouble our city. Come on, saints. The accusation, hey, listen, these men, these men won't hide in the closet. Come on, they won't play church. They climbed the mountain. They got something that's now affecting society. As long as the church hides in the little, our little church building and hides in the big culture, they, they, don't bother. they don't want what we have. They're comfortable with the bogey. They're comfortable with the making. They're comfortable with the world. But Sam, when, when we get something that's so powerful that we begin to change culture, culture no longer seduces and affects society, we change society. Come on, I double dog do you. Just seek God. Just if you seek Him, you'll find Him. We're not going to come out of law legalism. Well, it's, well, they got your, what do they think about me? I don't come to church. No, you're going to, you're here. I'm telling you, Jesus is the Son of God, and He's in you. If, see, I'm going to preach on something that's very familiar to you. We know a lot of what this happened. The problem is, I don't have what this says I could have. Come on, saints of God. And maybe one or two of you are honest enough that you don't have the fullness of this. 
These men are troubling our city. I hope we get to the point that that accusation uh, comes against us. And they're teaching cultures, cu- customs that we are not lawfully received. You know what they're doing down there? They're casting out devils. They're saying two words to people. I'm not going down to that church. <laughs> no, they don't bother me like that where I've been, where I've been going. Come on, saints of God. They preach against sin down there. They, they, they talk in the you know, they, they talk in those strange languages. And they believe in healing the sick. They're trying to raise the dead. They're saying two words to people down there. That's a, oh no, I can't. And they're teaching cuss. We're not used to what they're saying. The letter of the law killed, but the Spirit of God gives life. So I ask myself, do I have more of the letter of the law that kills, or do I have the Spirit that gives life? I want to be alive. I don't want to be in church and be bored and be dead. Here's what it says in the book of Amos. Seek ye me and you shall live. My God, I want to seek God. Come on, I didn't come to preach tonight. I came to seek God. I need more God. I need God in my life. These men, they're exceedingly troubled. They're troubling our city. The word trouble means they're disturbing our city. They're getting demonized people that we've been making money off of. They're getting them saved. The drug addicts coming off the street. The prostitutes are now in the house of God. They're no longer selling their butt. We used to make a lot of money off of them. These men are troubling our city. Let's arrest them. Beat them. What? Stop this thing before. Come on. Now, in our message Wednesday night, in our message Wednesday night, it said the man, the lame man got healed. What did they say? So that this message doesn't spread any further. Let's lie, but let's accuse him. Let's arrest him. Let's beat him. Let's put him in jail so that this message that they're preaching, so that it doesn't go any further. you got to understand, hell is trying to shut you up. But I'm telling you that God is raising up a voice in the willow. People that will not tiptoe through the tulip. People that are going to walk in the power and in the demonstration of the Spirit of the living God. There's people that will not compromise. There's people that determine if we're going to do this, we're going to go all the way with Jesus. I don't want to... There's a little thimble. Is, is that what you want for all week? Come on Sunday morning. No. Get your thimble for Do you want a river? No, river? Come on, do you want a river? The river yes. There is a river that makes glad the city of God. Yes. you got to understand, you hang around the river, the river will get in you and out of your belly. Shout for rivers of living water. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Come on, saints of God. I'm telling you that God is that river. And out of your belly, shout for rivers of living water. If you ever get... To the place that the river of God is pouring out of you. It will inoculate you from the world. Now, in Acts chapter 3, the man was healed. And there's about three chapters of nothing but persecution. Everything that happened then comes the, was the attack. we got to stop this. What are you talking about? A lame man getting healed? We have got to stop this because they'll leave they'll leave our little group and they begin following this Jesus character and we gotta stop this. That tell them to shut up, do not speak in this name any longer. In Acts chapter sixteen, the great big demon gets cast out. And there's a backlash. See if if you make an attempt Yes, right now. If you hear a Macedonian call come out from among them, and you come out from among them, and God looks down and see your separation, see, because the anointing is very costly. To be dead in church, there's no cost. That's why dead phony religion is so popular, there's no cost. We call it cost, we call it no cost religion. We call it Christless religion. We call it uh, a religion with no cross. There's no a bloodless religion. There's no big washing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Just come into a church building, but never been to the cross. We've got to get people to the cross. They've got to pass through their own personal Gethsemane. There's got to be the death. There's got to be the burial. And there is no resurrection lest there be a death. These men are troubling our city. 
and they're teaching cut, they're talking, they're telling people, talking, they're talking about Jesus being the Messiah, they're talking about the baptism of the Holy, they're talking about raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out the devil. Yeah. They're teaching customers, customs we're not used to. No. Yes, Lord. Neither to observe it. We are Romans. And the multitude rose up together against Paul and Silas, against them. And the magistrate tore off their clothes and committed to beat them. Have you ever tried to really get right with God? You got a position and all hell come against you to beat you down? Lies, accusation, hurts, wounds, things happen to provoke you, to disappoint you. Have you ever, you ever got some place, you got on the boat, or, or let's just say you're in the boat, and the wind of God blows, and your, and your sailboat is sailing, but then something happens that takes the wind out of your sails. Yeah. See, what I'm telling you, when you begin moving in the Spirit, hell says you're dangerous. Now, as long as we're in church dead, frustrated, bored, dissatisfied, frustrated, and can't wait to get out, we're no threat to the devil. Come on, we're no touch of the devil in that condition. But you get up and see the lame when somebody, when somebody who's been to the upper room comes into your life and says, get him in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk around. Get out of that religion. Stop shaking your tent up and get what God has for you. I got something for you that's bigger than money. I got the Holy Ghost and the baptism of fire for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up on there. Rise up and walk. Begin to walk in the fire. The demonstration of the Spirit of the living God. There's a fighting for the faith. Now, let me, so that we understand. Have you ever done something right? Suffered wrong? Did you, did you ever think like I did? You know, here I was a heathen, a heathen, see, then I got saved. I thought, everybody's going to love me now. Yes, yeah. I had more enemies after I got saved. Yes. And I had plenty of enemies before I got saved. But after I got saved, and then when I got baptized the Holy Spirit, I, the more anointed that you get, come on, saints of God, what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you, you're going to see somebody that has something from heaven that changing culture, you're going to see that that will be tested. I'm telling you, I'm being tested. I'm telling you, one or two of you being, I'm saying, the church is being tested. We're in a season. The sons of Issachar had an understanding of the season that they're living in. They understood we're in a season. I've chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Uh, I like teaching that to the kids downstairs, but I don't do it. Me in the fiery furnace? That's good teaching, that good theory, that good doctrine, but I've chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Remember now Job 23, you didn't really hear what I said before. Job said, when he tries me, I shall come forth. See, you've got to understand that when, when, we, when we're fighting for breakthrough and luck being increased, Sometimes when you when you begin to get in position, things will get worse before they get better. Right. I'm saying tonight with this small crowd, I'm being tested. Yeah. I'm saying you're being tested. That's my compliment. The small crowd tonight did not bother you. Amen. Come on, sister God. You have still reached out. You came in contact with God. Amen. You came in contact with God. You have to understand we're being tested tonight. We're being tested that God is building a church that gates of hell will not prevail again. I'm telling nothing. We're coming to a place of unbroken fellowship and communion and oneness for God. And how many, or how, how many or how few people does it keep you from getting to God? Jacob was alone. He wrestled. Jacob was alone. He wrestled. Come on, don't let anybody come on to keep you from wrestling. Hey, uh, Isaiah 48.10. I'm just going to quote you. You don't need to turn to it. God says, I've chosen you in the furnace of affliction. In the beginning, I didn't do real well in furnaces. Now I understand there's the other side of the furnace. Amen. That you go through something because you're going to something. Yes. And if we run from this work of the cross... If we run from our own personal Gethsemane, 
Have you ever prayed for more God? Have you ever prayed? Have you ever prayed for resurrection? And so then, you know, we, th- you know, I thought, well, just I'm just going to be in church, and this new anointing going to come upon me, and I'm going to be more powerful. I didn't understand that there were some things I had to work through, I had to fight through, I had to fight the fight of faith. I had to learn how to use weapons of warfare that I did not even know existed. That's right. Come on, and I had to, I had to get the weapons of warfare out of the realm of being good doctor and a good teacher and a good theory. I had to get them out of reality in my life. I had to learn how to pray. I had to learn how to praise. I had to learn how to seek God. I had to learn how to practice. I had to learn that the presence of God was more valuable than a whole bunch of people. Now, they're doing right things and they're beginning to suffer. In the beginning, I didn't suffer real well. But the Bible says in in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. See, you, the church has got to grow beyond the place. If a fly lands on my sandwich, I don't go flesh out and backslide for two weeks and then come back to the house of God. Well, God should have protected my sandwich from that fly. No, God, God is looking for people. They will not throw in the towel. They're not looking for an excuse to go sin and flesh out and blame someone, someone else, the church, God, or whatever, blame somebody. Got to find somebody to blame. I'm telling you, God is looking for people. If you, the Bible said this, if you faint in the day of adversity, your faith is small. So you ask for more faith, you might find yourself in a season of adversity. And you will begin to realize problems becomes a friend in disguise. Here's my title. Can God trust you with trouble? Can God trust you with trouble? Okay. And now, Sam, I'm going to say something that this scripture makes my own flesh crawl. But I've been delivered many times, but I, I know sometimes it's a tough pill to swallow. When I call, when I call the scripture, some of your flesh are going to crawl. Romans 8, 28. All things... There are going to be things happening in your life. You look at the circumstance you think, I don't know how anything good could ever. How can anything, this death, how can anything? Resurrection. No death, no resurrection. I'm saying that there will be things that look just outright impossible, but the Bible says the things are possible with men are possible with God. God is putting people especially leadership, I'm telling you, God is dealing with the head of the body. It will come down. It coming to the pulpit. It will come to the pew. God is testing it. The fiery trial of our faith that's more precious than gold. This has got to become a reality with it. Get your fight back. Get your zeal back. The kingdom of heaven is suffering from it. And the very take it by force. Jacob was left alone and he wrestled until the breaking of the day. You can, I got to learn how to get along with God and wrestle. You don't need a big club. You just need a place you can go get along with God. Can I say this in the natural? I, I'm not trying to be carnal. Knew how to puff on evil we no one around. <laughs> Didn't need a crowd. You go soak up some suds with no one around. We could curse in our heathen days with no one around. So we could curse with no one around. Can we pray Amen. with no one around? Yes, Lord. So what is happening? Paul is minding his own business. He finds this little guy by the name of Timothy. Timothy becomes a, a spiritual son to Paul. They begin this journey. Paul's minding his own business. Here he's, uh, oh, this is great. Here I am. God called me to be this apostle. And, and now God give me this spiritual son. And, and we're just going to live happily ever after. And then what happens? Then a vision comes. It gets a Macedonian call. And he leaves where he is to go to another place. And when he gets there, this woman, a seller of purple, she gets saved. They baptize her. God provides a place to stay. She opens up her heart to God. She opens up her house to them. She opens up her, her purse to them. 
and they're minding their own business, and then here comes this demonized woman. What does he do? He answers the call of God. He's at the right place at the right time. He's minding his own business. All kinds of things are happening. Timothy, Lydia, place to stay. All kinds of things are beginning to happen. And then this demonized woman comes, and all he does is say two words. Now, there's a backlash to this two, word, two words. And we've learned that, haven't we? There's a backlash. If you don't, like, if you don't understand, there's a backlash to those two. Those, the backlash to those two words is not just back there. There's still a backlash to those two words today. You, 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 you talk about you want to stir up some devils. Uh, I'm, uh, there's two. Uh, well, <laughs> how can I say this? I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I, I can't tell a story. I, I, so, so let me. Just, I'll just say something in general. Well, I, I will, I'll just say this. <laughs> um, I'm a, I'm a little loud, and you know, I kind of got a bull in the china closet, anointing every now and then. <laughs> But Pastor Jan is loving and gentle, sweet. There are people who can really receive from Pastor Jan. <clears throat> I'm a little harder to. And so, you know, Pastor Jan and I got married. We got started ministering, and and so <clears throat> she'd never really been in the ministry before, and and so a lot of the opposition came against me. And then Pastor Jan started growing. Pastor Jan started getting an anointing. And so Pastor Jan one time just, and you know how sweet Pastor Jan is. So Pastor Jan tells this lady, you need deliverance. (laughs) (laughs) This woman spent five years, five years of her life trying to destroy us, especially her. Now, don't throw tomatoes at me. Because in the beginning, the backlash came against me. Yes. But as she grew in the Lord, some of the yeah. backlash began to... I'm going, yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah! Yeah, because I was growing. You don't understand. It was a good, it was a good sign. You don't understand. If you understood. Yeah. See, faith grows. Yeah. Okay. See, when, when the Bible says, yeah. Woe to you when all men speak yeah. well of you. Yeah. When she was... Yeah so loving she wouldn't say because she didn't want her people when she was so when she grew in God she was willing not to hurt she loved God so much she was not willing to hurt God and understood that sometimes you've got to be willing to be misunderstood Jesus called division not everybody loved Jesus they nailed him to a cross Come on, so it's not anything negative. We have got to stop sticking our head in the sand because the kingdom of heaven is suffered violent and the violent will take it by force. When we come to a place in love that we stop sticking our head in the sand and pretend there is no problem, when we start affecting culture and culture no longer affects us, even those are backlash in culture. Five years, this woman, five years, calling everybody. And if someone went to our church, someone from our church went to another church, I had people say she would walk from one side of the church to the other side of the church and say bad things about us. The Bible said, woe to you when all men speak well of you. You need enemies. You may not understand it, but you need enemies. An enemy will push me further and motivate me more than a friend. That may not be true for you, but maybe, maybe it's because of my sport background. Let an enemy rise up against me. I'm really, I'm double focused now. I'll be focused without an enemy, but I'm double focused. Yes. You need an enemy. Woe to you when I'm in speak well. I'm saying there's a church that's not, they don't want to offend God and they're willing to offend people to be misunderstood. See, the devil's trying to train people. If you cast out devils and you get the lame people walking, there'll be a price to pay. Yes. So I'm saying, 
what this is my this is how I say it. You don't have to. You could say, probably say it in a better way than me. But I say there's a professional religious system out there that has compromised the word of God because they don't want to offend people. So they're willing to compromise God's word to say there's no more signs, wonders, miracles, healing, the other talking to tongues, gifts of the Spirit. And if it happens, that's the devil down there. And so they're compromised. They're trying to be spiritually, politically correct rather than scripturally correct because they don't want to offend people. Because they're more focused, they want more focused about people and money in their building than they are uh, them getting people to heaven. They're more concerned about getting people into the church than they are getting the people to God. I'm preaching better than some say it, amen. Now, What's the result of their ministry? The rose up the multitude rose up not with them but against them. The multitude rose up against them and the magistrate tore off their clothes. Isn't this something people like Joseph get a robe and see you you get you get dressed in robes of righteousness, get dressed in fine white linen, and you watch the devil show up, try to tear off the anointing that God had placed upon you. And they tore off their clothes and come in, beat these people. What I'm saying, now you've, if you don't understand this, you don't understand that, well, let me, let me back, I'm going to illustrate it this way. I did not understand it, but as a young man being a sports player, the other team's opposition, the other team saying and think bad things about me, I didn't understand it was preparation for ministry. Then when I became a hippie, there was no one lower than a hippie upon the face of the earth. They were saying all kind of bad things about hippie. I didn't understand it was preparation for ministry. Wow. You long-haired, you you blank, you blank, you blank, you get cursed out, spit on all kind of things. Happen. You and I didn't understand it was preparation for ministry. So when I got saved, I thought well, everybody going to love me now. But I realized that more came against me. Yeah. See, the enemy is trying to get the church put get back in the boat. Peter got out of the boat. Right. He began. He wanted to walk in the walk in the, walk on water. Which is the type of walking in the Spirit. If you want to get out of the boat, if you want to get out of the boat of religion and follow Jesus and walk in the, walk in the Spirit, hell will come against you. Yeah. There will be a storm that rises up to try to get your eyes off of Jesus so that you'll sing. But when Peter got his eyes back upon Jesus, then he yeah. began to walk. But what I'm telling you is that right here, you've got to understand, see, the enemy is going to try to come against you and the enemy is going to turn against Try to convince you there's something wrong with you because people are talking about you. And what I'm telling you, they said bad things about Jesus. Yes. And you got to understand that's why you and I got to deal with our rejection. We got to deal with our fears. We got to deal with our stuff now. Because the further the further you go in God, the more opposition and resistance gonna come against you. Right. New level, new devil. Right. You get to the place. Where, where the lame will begin walking and you begin casting demons out, out, of, uh, out of people, then uh, these things that happen to you, they, they tore off their clothes and they come in to beat them. And when they laid many stripes upon them, they're beating them with stripes, a type of Christ. Who and what has been beating upon you to shut you up, to get you hurt, to get you wounded? So that you will be alive with God. So that you will be casting out devils and healing the sick and walking the path. Who and what has been beating upon you to condemn you, to lie about you, to accuse you, to reject you, to hurt you, to provoke you, to get you under forgiveness and bitterness, to get you to quit the ministry? Who and what has been coming to get you, beating upon you, stripping you of your, of your robes of righteousness and your fine white linen? And when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison. The devil is trying to put people in jail cells of hurt and wound and rejection and fear, intimidation and poverty and sickness yeah. and attitudes. Mean as a junkyard dog. The devil is trying to hurt you. Yeah. Not for doing something wrong, not because of sin. Amen. If we were in sin, we would understand it, that, that things would go wrong. But when you begin to do right, yeah. then you begin to understand that. And then you begin to see the song that we sang tonight was that was that it was the love of Jesus who was sinless and he was all that he was willing to suffer for you and I. Yes. Knowing how we would forsake him, yes. knowing how we would follow him from afar, knowing the wrong mistake that we would choose after we met him, and he still loved us, he still suffered, he still went through all that oh. stuff for you and I. So they cast him in prison. And I'm telling you, 
Hell's trying to put you in a, a prison of bitterness, rejection, anger, frustration. The enemy is doing everything. The devil's doing everything he can to try to get you to throw in the towel, to quit. Sometimes, sometimes you'll see people in church, but the truth is they've thrown in the towel, but they got too much spiritual pride to admit it, so they come to church and pretend. See, they've been immunized from real Christianity. They got enough to keep them from the real thing, because they're settling for they're settling for being immunized, so that they never catch the right thing. Some things are better caught than taught. So some people have been immunized from the real Jesus. You, you have to understand. And I, I'm telling you, I've learned this the hard way. I'm telling you that I've been there. I've been, I've been, uh, I've spent more than my fair share of time because before I learned deliverance. Now, now that I know deliverance, something may, something may affect me, but it'll only be for a while. Yes. It'll be for a few minutes or a few hours, but it's coming out of me because I know how to yeah. get it out of me. But way back then, when I first got saved, I didn't understand all this stuff. And things would be said, and all kind of hurts and wounds came in. But I never threw it in the towel. Now, we're coming to a, a lot of what God wants to say. They, they received the charge. They thrust them into, okay, they took it. They cast them in prison, charging the jailer, keep them safely. Don't let them be like these two guys that escaped wherever, wherever in the northeast. Who, oh, having received such a charge, they thrust them into the inner prison, and they made their feet fast in stocks. Now, I've been stood in jails before. They, you go through one, one lock gate, another lock gate, another lock gate. And then they take you to another place. There's a lock door. Then you go in. They got the outer jail cells, and then there's inner jail cells. I mean, there's a whole lot of doors you got to go through. The lock doors and bars that you got to go through to get out of there. And they, they, that's what they did. They they locked them up in prison, and they put their feet in stocks. Now, prophetic picture. Satan wants to put you in a position where you can't go, where you where you feel led to go. And you can't do what you want to do. There could be a certain place, like a holding pattern, that the Spirit of God. Now, remember, there's four there's four type of fires: judgment fire, the equipping fire, the cleansing fire, and the fiery trial of our faith. And what we're seeing right here, there are going to be things happen. There's a prophetic picture right here that if you do not understand this, when it happens to you, see, we could tell this to someone else. We could go downstairs and we could teach it to the children and make sense to it. But when you're the one locked up, when you're the one been put in the hole, when you're the one with the feet in stocks where you can't go where you want to go, where you know you're supposed to be, someone locks you up. Something has happened to you. And you can't do what you want, what you know you're supposed to do. You can't go where you know you're supposed to go. Something has happened to you. It's not because you did something wrong. You did something right. And the devil will lie to you and say, if your God is so good, how come? And see, what I'm telling you, they that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploit. God is putting it, God is putting people, God is putting people, remember now, no temptation has overtaken you but such as coming with man, but God is faithful. And will not allow you to be tempted and tested above and beyond what you were able, but oh, will, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God will not let you go into something unless He knows you can come through this thing. God knows what you got and what's within you. He knows your heart. So there's no temptation to overtake you, but such as common to man. Somebody's been through this. Now, so, so basically, here's what Paul, here's what God is saying to Paul and Silas. Paul is, God Almighty, God Himself, is saying to Paul Silas, I can trust you with trouble. Oh, yes, Lord. So the question, can, when God looks down and sees me, can He trust me with? Can God trust you with trouble? Will I be faithful on a sunny spring day? There you go. When Pastor Jane and I got married, we had this, we had this wonderful house, and we, and we had a, 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 a back uh Deck. We had a deck, and the kids gave us uh, a birdhouse. And we weren't we weren't excited about a birdhouse. So that's why they gave us a birdhouse. Well, that's not that's that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we put the birdhouse out there just because they gave us the birdhouse, and then the birds start coming. We start getting addicted to the birds. 
So we went and bought another birdhouse. <laughs> then we bought another birdhouse. Then we bought another birdhouse. And we called it Birdieville. Yes, we did. Yeah, was- and Pastor Jane had this overnight job. Pastor Jane had this overnight job, and, and she, she at first, she was into the birds a whole lot more than me. And I'm telling you that these birds, uh, I don't know if they were doves, doves or pigeons, I'm not for sure. In the cruelest part of winter, I'm, say, I'm telling you the wind chill was 20 below zero. And these birds would perch in, in this rosebud tree we had right behind the, the deck. And the birds are up there, and, and the wind, the northern wind, and 20 below zero, snow upon the ground. And these birds know that Pastor Jan comes out every morning and feeds them. And they're up there in this tree, and they got a way, certain way of poofing up their feathers to block the wind. Wow. And they're up there, and I look out the, I, I'm not the one that's willing to pay the price to go out 20 below zero. And when I, I don't have that much love for the birdies yet, I did later on. But in the beginning, they're waiting for parents. They know, they know that blonde-haired woman comes out about so there they are out there. Here, here these birds are. They're willing to overcome adversity because they, they have faith that they're going to be fed. And those birds have more faith that they're going to be fed than some church coming people that God feed me the bread of life. So man with his little tin cup, he came expecting. Now he was expecting the wrong thing. He was expecting to hear coin dropping his little tin cup. See, we got to have a spirit of expectation. Hell was trying to shut you up. Hell was trying to hurt you and lock you up and get you where you can't walk in the spirit and not walk in the power of the demonstration of the spirit of the living God. And I'm telling you, God is, God is awakening His church. God is saying to Paul and Silas, I can trust you. I'm going to allow you to go through something. And I know I can trust you, so I'm going to allow you to be put in the circumstance. How many people would have got past it? They're lied about, they're accused. And then they got arrested. And then they, they tore their clothes off of them. And then they beat them. And then they locked them up in a jail. But, and they put their feet in stocks. And they got them locked up in a, in a prison. But see, they forgot to stick a stocking down their mouth. They couldn't, they, they didn't learn. Come on, saints of God, I'm telling you that some people can have more church, some people can have more church in a jail cell than some people have in a Pentecostal church. Come on, saints of God, hear that, hear that, hear that. Some people have more church in a jail cell than some Pentecostal people in a church building. My God. So much truth, so much truth that brings more conviction than a shout. Now, what I'm what I'm saying is, God knew He could trust Paul and Silas with trouble. So, can God trust me with trouble? Everything that Job is going through in in, in Job twenty three ten said, when He tries me. When God tries me, I shall come forth pure as gold, because I'm determined. Nothing or no one, I will not throw in the towel. I've come this far. I've come too far to turn back now. I'm not throwing in the towel. I'm not quitting for nothing or no one. It is settled within me. It doesn't make any sense. Now see, be careful. Be careful. Because sometimes we pray little prayers. And we don't understand how it happens, how it gets answered. We may look at Job and say, well, Job ended up with twice as much. But who is willing to go through what Job went through to get? Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that God has strange methods of enlargement. Strange methods of enlargement. And if we don't understand how God... If we understand how a man can build muscle by pumping out, I'm telling you, God is increasing your love level. There's people around you. Get on your nerves. Some of you act like you don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) There are more people know what I'm telling I'll talk over here. I got an amen corner over here. I'll have an amen corner. I know know where to go when I need. In a certain area, I know where to go. Get an amen. So the question for me is, can God trust me? 
with trouble. Can God trust this church with trouble? Will we believe what we see? Will we believe what we hear? Will we believe what we feel? Or will we believe God? Yeah. If we faint in the day of adversity, our faith is small. So be careful saying something like, God increased my faith. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The trial of your faith is more precious than gold. So then there'd be two doors. And, and one, if you go out that door, you get a bar of gold. But if you go out this other door, you get a great big trial. Yes. That is more precious than gold. So then, which door will we go through? Because that's what we choose on a daily basis. And God is watching by the choices that we make. And so we pray certain things and certain things happen. But God knew that he could trust Paul and Silas. So all these things happened to them. Now, at verse 25, follow closely. And at midnight, Paul and Silas begin to curse and choke that parakeet. That poor little parakeet. They thought, well, no one one in church, no one in the synagogue would know if I choked a parakeet. So in here, no one would know. So I'm going to... What did they do? See... Out of the mouth comes the abundance of the... What I'm telling you, you and I will be put in circumstances, in situation. It does not make any sense. They that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploit for God. So God told Paul, God told Saul, to, before he made it, Paul said, I'm going to show him what great things he must suffer. See, so God, God knew that he could trust him because God had put something in him. God had put the goji within him. Come on, God had put the go, you got put the fight within him. I'm telling you, you're different people, got different kind of a nerve, and God had put the fight within him. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violence. So at midnight, in that dark hour, it never darker than, see, in that dark hour, they begin to pray. They begin to pray, and they begin to sing praises. See, what is, what's coming out of our mouth? I'll tell you what comes out of our mouth, what's in our heart. Yes. Yes. The Bible says out of the mouth comes the abundance of the heart. So God trying to, see when God looks down and he sees, he sees that God has allowed somebody. Now uh, remember, Paul, God had done such a work in Paul that when Lydia heard him, she opened up her heart. And the only way that could happen because see, Paul had opened up his heart because his heart had been opened to God. You can't give to other people what you don't have yourself. And what, what see, uh, the reason sometimes we, we're not really taking ground from the enemy because the enemy still had too much ground in us. So we give that ground, we give that ground to God, then God takes that ground to them, and now you begin to take ground from the enemy and other people. And so the woman opened up her heart to God because she could discern something has happened in this man called Paul. He's a chosen vessel that God said, I'm going to show him what great thing he must suffer. I'm saying that God is ready to give him a church that everything will not be tiptoed through the tulips. Amen. Not everything going to always be real perfect. There's going to be some adversity. There's going to be some problems. And God's looking for people. Anybody can pray in Saturday prayer. But who can pray when? Come on. When what happens to you happens to them right there. See what I'm telling you, God's grace. God is looking for people that will cultivate a prayer life alone with God. Jacob was left alone and he wrestled with the angel till the breaking of the day. You and I got to learn how to get alone with God and wrestle and tail. We got to wrestle and tail the breaking. Yes, very true. What I'm saying is, yes, Lord. You and I are going to be put in circumstances. You're not going to have a few years to develop a prayer life. That's right. Yes. Things are going to happen. 
And see, God knew who he could allow to be put in that circumstance because God knew he could trust right. Paul and Silas with trouble. So uh, I watch it. See, uh, so you watch one little thing go wrong in your life. And God's watching. How will Pastor Bill respond? Do I have to go there? I'll go there. It's tired last night. I was tired. I walked Pastor Jane to the door. She went to her overnight job. Kissed Pastor Jan goodnight. Came in the, <clears throat> the door of the fellowship hall. And I looked up and this had the nerve, this wasp. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> this wasp flying around right over my head in God's house and God's fellowship hall right in front of me. And I said, <laughs> and so I, I run real quick to that door to close it so they couldn't come in the sanctuary. And I go, got you, wasp. You're, you're going to die. It's on. Let's get it on, wasp. I've defeated a gnat. Now, I've defeated the demon of a, the size of a fly. It's on. I know this is my test. So I get my spray out. I got my wasp spray. And I got my other kind of spray. And I'm loaded. I said, let's, let's go. There's no wasp. Can't find a wasp. The wasp. <laughs> so I'm going, did he sneak in the sanctuary before I got the door closed? So I come in and I turn the lights on. I'm looking for the wasp. I'm hearing little irritable thoughts. I don't want to be dealing with this this late at night. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> There's no wasp in here. I go back in the fellowship hall. And I go, I'm going to call upon the angels of God. God bring angels in here. And have an angel stir up that wasp. I'm going to kill that wasp. <laughs> so I turn the ceiling fan on the fellowship hall. And... <laughs> it goes flying right through. So I reach for all my stuff real quick, and he lands on one. Uh, there's some yellow flowers above of the door going into the church kitchen. And he lands on these flowers. So I'm standing there with my wasp spray, because it'll shoot about 10 feet. So I'm standing there, I'm poised to kill a wasp. Trouble is, he disappears. And I wait. And I wait. <laughs> And I realized my attitude is being chested. And I go, I just felt led to spray that flower. So I squirt the wasp spray up there. And I go, surely I go stir him up. No wasp. So I wait and I wait and I wait and I wait. And I climb up on the table. And there on that shelf, laying on his back with his little feet up in the air. <laughs> So my reward will be a demon the size of a sparrow. Now you watch, little things are happening. Because God gave you this message this morning. You know what happened today? Almost everything that could go wrong went wrong. I go out to the mailbox just to get the mail. I, I, oh, I just can't wait to take a shower. And I, I'm going to read, real spiritual, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to prepare more for the message. I, I, go to, I go to the mailbox and the lady in the roundhouse. i got ants in the house. I have to work over there for four to five minutes. Now I'm killing ants. And I realize I'm being tested. One thing after another, after another, after another, after another. And see, I realize when I pray something like this, when I pray something like, God, show me me. Examine my heart. See if there be any wicked way. I was just going to... 
in case, I'm sure there's not much, but in case there's anything left in me, God. So the way God, I don't know how God deals with me, but, but get that book, The Release of the Spirit by Watch Many, and it'll tell you how God deals with stuff. And God deals with me by things going wrong. And I have to watch my mouth, I've got to watch my attitude, I've got to watch my thoughts, I've got to watch my behavior. i got to keep my hands off of that parakeet. And all these things, seriously, I'm telling you, all these little things happening. See, because Satan wants us to flesh out. And then you come to the house of God, you get ready to pray. You get ready to praise. And you'll hear a voice. You choked that parakeet today. Well, I didn't choke him, but you, but you, cursed, the, you cursed the feathers right off of it. And there he is with no feathers. <laughs> See, the Bible says this is a little fox that spoiled the vine. Now, what I'm telling you, in all, in all seriousness, you got to understand what is happening in this. Oh, oh God, I've got to get. I got to go somewhere. I got to. I got to take you somewhere else here in just a little bit. I almost forgot. You got to understand that God right now is building a church. And he's not building this church that the gates of hell will not prevail against on Easy Street. That's right. Our faith is being tested. You and I are going through adversity. And I, I got to um, I got to get away from storytelling. Here here's what God is saying. Here's what God wants. He's looking for people that in the days of adversity that they can still pray, that can still sing, that can still praise, that can still worship when it doesn't make any sense. Because God said all things work together to the good. You do not have to wait for circumstances to line up to have your song back. That's right. It's God. during a trial. Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials and tribulation testing, knowing that the testing of your faith work of patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be found perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You don't have to wait till the trial is over or you come out of the fiery furnace to sing. You can sing in it. Paul said, I learned the glory in tribulation because tribulation were perseverance. Perseverance results in proof of character. Proof of character results in hope. And hope makes one not to be ashamed. God is building a church that would not be ashamed. Because, see, you're not, you're not going to flesh out that you're, go you're not going to let anything or anyone break your continuous fellowship and relationship, unbroken, unbroken communion and unbroken fellowship with God. And when you get to that place, even when they lock you up, they put you to play, they strip you, they strip you what God put upon you, and they put you where you can't walk where you, in the way that you want to walk. But see, they couldn't stop them from praying and couldn't stop them from singing. And what happened? At midnight they sang, and, they, and the prisoners heard them. I'm saying that other people in bondage will hear what's coming out of your mouth. And God is looking for somebody that's going to rise up above their circumstance and their situation when other people throw the towel, when other people become bitter, when other people use that as an excuse to go back and flesh out in their sin. They're going to hear you praying and praising and singing that you've been counted worthy to suffer persecution for His holy name because you're that in love with God. That you have become so, that's right, you're, you're so Christ-like that you begin to experience the same persecution and lies and accusation that they did to Jesus. Now, I've got to cut this part short. I, have, I was going to go somewhere with this, but let me just say that. They sing in such a way, there was an earthquake, and the, jail, the prison doors were opened up. And I'm saying that there's a place... That's why hell didn't want you to pray. Hell didn't want you to sing. Hell didn't want you to praise. Hell didn't want you to worship. There's a place that your prayer life and your singing and your praise and your worship can be so powerful, it will shake and there, be a, there was an earthquake and opened up the jail cell. And then the, the jailer said, the jailer was going to kill himself. And then, and then all his family, the man said, what shall I do to be saved? And uh, uh, him and all his household to get saved. And what I'm telling you, is that there's a church that will not be affected by culture. They're going to pray and sing and praise and worship. There's going to be a shaking that's going to go on, and they will break things loose. Yes, Lord. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Now, because <clears throat> this is very important, I'm not, not going to keep you much longer. I'm going to do everything I can to get you about, out by 5 a.m. so you can shower before you go to work tomorrow. Now let me say, I'll say this again. 
Because you're going to hear this from John Ramirez. That when, that when he got saved, he went to church. And, you know, people were going to church one, one, one hour, one and a half. When they when they worship Satan, they would go they would go at seven o'clock at night and stay there till five o'clock in the morning. Oh, yes. well, yeah. They were dedicated. They were consecrated. What they believed in, and folk that the oh. people that like me that did big boy drug, we didn't we didn't we didn't go to a party for an hour and a half and go home. I mean, I saw the sun come up many times. Guess what I'm saying? That there's a church that was the fullest of the things of God in Hebrews chapter twelve. Now remember, they were praying, they were praising, they were worshiping in such a way. I'm telling you, you could come to church so tired, you could hardly, you could hardly keep yourself awake. But I'm telling you, the anointing of God touch you, and you come become so alive, you become so touched so far, you go home, you can't sleep, because you've got to seek God, because seek ye me, and you shall live! You're so alive in God! Yes. <laughs> Hebrews said 12, 25, See that you did not refuse Him that's speaking. See, we got to get out of the habit of coming to church and hearing, but not doing. Oh. God will give you word, and in that word to be an assignment, then He stands back and what? Who will come into alignment with the assignment? Yes, Think of the people that come to church 30, 40, 50 years. How many hundreds of missions oh. have they heard of prayer and still have little or no prayer life? Oh. Hypocrisy! Oh, yes, Lord. See, you did not refuse Him that speaketh. Which means preach or utter. It means to utter words, to talk. It means to tell. For if they did not escape who refused him that spoke upon earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him, from God that's speaking from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. His voice shook the earth. It said back there, see, they begin to pray, they begin to sing, they begin to pray, they begin to worship such a way. There was an earthquake. There was a shaking that went on. In, in Acts 4.31, and said the and when they prayed, the place was shaken. Now let me just say this, okay? And I know I know not everyone's schedule can do this. But I'm gonna tell you, hell will fight you for coming to pre service prayer. I'm gonna tell you hell will fight people coming to Saturday prayer. Pre service prayer is not increasing, gets decreasing. Saturday prayer is not increasing, gets decreasing, numerically. And I'm saying that you and I got to get low. We got to learn to get low. We got to wrestle. We got to get something. We got to see. We got to have faith. There's a shaking that's going to go on. We got to get back the spirit of prayer. We got to get the vision. Whose voice then shook the earth. And now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth. I'm going to shake heaven again. I'm not for sure how all that's going to come out. But I'm going to shake heaven. That one will shake heaven once again. And this word, yet once more. Signified the removing, the removing of those things that are shaken, so that those things that cannot be shaken shall remain. God said, "Then I'm gonna, uh, I'll see. Uh, let me illustrate that. I'm gonna serve you, God, all the days of my life. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come to. Uh, I'm gonna come to water baptism at First Love Minister Church, and you're sitting at the table waiting to get water baptized, and a mosquito coming." <laughs> drill on you. <laughs> and if we become a mass murderer because the mosquito bit us, then we're not ready. But we can be ready. See, we got to stop. See, he said, God, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. I'm saying that right now, you and I, this church, the whole kingdom of God, there's a shaking going on, and God is watching. Who will not throw in the towel? Who will rise up? Who will fight this fight? Who will be faithful? That will count themselves worthy. The sucker saved for his holy. It doesn't matter who, how many choose to go to hell, go back to the world, go back to dead religion, throw in the towel, how many quit. It makes no difference because you put them in a jail, you lock them up, they're still going to pray, they're going to pray, they're going to worship, they'll be left alone, they're going to wrestle with God until the breaking of the day. They ain't got to fight with it. the kingdom of heaven, suffer from and the violent take it by force. Come on, give it. Come on, praise him. Somebody needs to give God some praise. Come on, somebody. Give God some praise. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Praise him, praise him. Praise him. Praise him. You're being in circumstances, situation. God testing you. Will you pray? Will you praise? Will you worship? Or will you curse? Will you read your Bible? Or go back to your television set? We're being tested. 
God has shaken everything that can be shaken. So that which cannot be shaken will remain. There's a shaking going on. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. I have a question. Can God trust you with trouble? So if you've got you a beautiful Dagwood sandwich out there and a bug lands on it, <laughs> you're not going to become a mass murderer, are you? <laughs> and blame God. God, you should have protected. I prayed over my meal and that bug landed on my, on my Dagwood sandwich. How come, God, you're not protecting me? Well, you didn't ask for angelic protection. What's happening? Even tonight when I have this type of message, you've got to understand I'm being tested. I'm saying the church is being tested. You are being tested. I'm saying that the church all around the earth is being tested. God is shaking everything. It can be shaken. So that which cannot be shaken will remain. God is building a church. The gates of hell will not prevail again. He has... As God told, God loosed Satan on Job. You can touch all that he has, but you can't take his life. And I'm saying that Job is a type of the church. And God has stood back, said, Satan, the devil said, the devil said that Job will curse you to your face. You let me touch him. But the only reason, the devil was saying, the only reason... Job was serving you because of what you've given him and what you've done for him. God said you could touch everything. And God did not know. The devil did not know that God was setting up the devil. The devil thought he was setting up God. But God was setting up the devil. And what God was making a statement, and this is where you come in. God was making a statement out of people that will serve me because they love me, not because of what I give for them. Yes. Not because of how good, not because of what I give them, not because of their farm, not because of their crops, not because of their farm animals, not because of their large family, not because of all that I give them, not because they have a lot of money. They will serve me without all of that. They will serve me because they love me. You're serving God because you love Him. You will not go in the town. You will not quit. You're not going to hell for anything or anyone. And you're not going to give up your inheritance. I'm saying if we're going to do this, let's go all the way with God. God is shaking everything that can be shaken so that which cannot be shaken will remain. The devil will lie to you. The devil will accuse you that you're going through these problems because God doesn't love you. He's lying to you. The devil's a liar. And I'm saying your faith is being tested. The removing of those things that are shaken the things that are made so those things that cannot be shaken will remain. Now here's what I'm saying. That which cannot be shaken, that which chooses to remain, no matter what circumstances say, no matter what's going on uh, in our nation, on earth, in the economy, in politics, in your family, on your job, no matter what's going on, you're going to be found faithful to God because you love God and you've chosen. You're not going to throw in the towel for anything or anyone, and that's called the remnant. And I challenge you to get that book by Pat Chatsline. He's going to come and preach our October convention, I Am Remnant, by Pat Chatsline. Yeah. And I'm telling you, that is a beautiful picture. And I'm telling you, God gave me this message today when I saw this, is that God is raising up people. The circumstance, you're doing, you're doing what's right, and you're beginning to suffer wrong. And see, we're not suffering like some other third world uh, countries, but they're, they're beginning. And here's, a, here's, a, here's an example the Holy Spirit gave me today. I think it was Chris or some, someone told me the story that uh, when ISIS beheaded the, you know, those couple groups, there was 20 some or something, they beheaded. One of them, one of the men gave a Bible to one of the ISIS guys. And, and I think he read it and got saved. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. The, the, one of these guys that was going to be beheaded had a Bible and gave it to a member of ISIS. So you're going to behead me anyway. I'm going to give you my Bible. And the guy kept the, uh, that was such a message. Now, see what, I, what I'm telling you. See, uh, if whew, it's hard for me to compare myself with that guy. See, if, I, if I'm still getting upset over a wasp, 
how would I respond if it was me on that ocean shore with ISIS lined up with swords to whack my head? And none of them denied Christ. And all of them willingly. Remember what Jesus said? I turned my back to my smiters with joy. Go ahead. Give me your best hit. Give me everything that you got. I'll take it. Because I love you. Nothing or no one can move me. What I'm saying to you, that everything that was said, everything that was done to Jesus, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have whooped up on some folk. You know the devil was talking to him. Call down those. (laughs) Imagine being those people on that shore about to be beheaded. And all they had to do to save their own life was deny Jesus and become a Muslim. And none of them betrayed God. They were willing to die for what they believed in. I'm saying there's a whole lot of shaking and that something is happening in the spirit realm. There's a new demonic thing that's been happening. And see, God is beginning to awaken people. He's beginning to awaken us to righteousness. He's beginning to awaken the church. This is not time to play. That's right. Not time to play. And uh, let me turn to uh, Revelation. I, I need to share this. I think it's going to help you. That's a beautiful picture of Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. I know your works. I know your, I know your tribulation. And I know your poverty, but you are rich. See, there's people that don't have a lot of money in the natural, but they're rich spiritually. I know your tribulation. I know your works. I know your poverty, but you are rich, which means you have abundance. You have full. I know the blasphemy of them that say that they're not Jews, and uh, that say that they are Jews, but they are not. But they are actually of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things that, that, that thou shalt suffer. Fear none of those things that thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. The devil shall cast some of you into prison, and you may be tried, which means tested, proved, assayed, and scrutinized. You shall have tribulation, which means trouble, persecution, pressure, affliction. You shall have trouble for ten days. Be thou faithful in the death. And I'll give you a crown of life. Now, what a lot of people don't understand is that God has stood back. The devil has asked permission. God said, I will, have a, I will have a church that will be faithful to me. Satan, no matter what you say, no matter what you, no matter what you do to them, they're going to be faithful to me because they love me. Not because of what I give them, not because of what I do. They will serve me because I love them. And there are seasons, I believe, that, that God just stands back and there's a new, the hordes of hell begin marching against the church and God is looking for people that will not be overcome, but will overcome them. They will not be overcome by Satan. They will actually overcome the devil. Yes, Submit Lord. therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Okay, so there's, there's a place, and, and God bring you through. Real quick, First Peter chapter 4. And I'm going to come in for landing as soon as I can. I want to get this one little part in. First Peter chapter 4. And verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange, the fiery trial that is to try you. See, the fiery trial, that's, that's the four kind, one of the four, uh, what I call the four types of fire. Beloved, do not think it strange, the fiery trouble, which means that, that smeltering thing, that calamity is a death, that ignition. Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you. The word try there means to put it, a pudding to prove by experiment of good or evil. It means adversity. It means that you will be scrutinized, that you will be given an opportunity to prove your love for God. To prove who your God is and who you're faithful to. And I'm saying that adversity and temptation will not overcome you. Problems will not overcome you. Can God trust me with trouble? Can God trust today's church with trouble? Do not think it's strength to fiery trial to come to try you. What I'm telling you, temptation is an opportunity to prove your love and faith to God. Other people are hoping a temptation will come so they can blame it. Well, the devil tempted me. And the devil may be denied, didn't Temptation merely presents us with a choice and it reveals what's really in our heart. Temptation doesn't make us sin. It reveals who we are and what we would do if given the opportunity. It will show if is the either 
either God, either God the truth is our, uh, our God, or the devil the liar is our God. Either the liar or the truth. So God, there'll be a, there'll be a temptation and we can prove who we're loyal to. Do not be concerned there's a strange trial, that fiery trial that come to try you, though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice. Yay. Rejoice in so much that you are partakers of Christ's suffering. Amen. Partakers of Christ's suffering. Come on. A demon the size of a net not going to take you down. A demon the size of a fly not going to take you down. The demon the size of a wasp not going to take you down. Or a sparrow not going to take you down. Come on. Inside of you is a man of war. A giant killer is within you. You're going to move mountains. Yes, Lord. But rejoice in much that you are partaker of the Christ. Suffering. When his glory shall be revealed, you shall be glad with exceedingly joy. If you reproach for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory of God will rest upon you. In the, verse 16, if any man suffers a Christian, do not let him be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Verse 17, oh. prophetic team, tune in. Uh, oh. Get number 121. Maybe. Said so all that to say this, verse 17, for the time is, present tense come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. The word judgment means a sin pronounced either either in victory or defeat. So either, either we're going to be an opportunity to choose promotion or demotion. The truth or a lie. Okay, so time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God, and it fir- first begins at us. What shall be the end of them that do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's bow our heads there. We'll go close right there.